Not by any conscious design, Coulter headed back north. He didn't know where he was going, or what he was going to do when he got there. The mission that Ruth had sent him on now seemed poignantly pointless. In fact, nothing at all seemed to make sense anymore. He rode blindly, his thoughts murky, and his side and his torn ear aching. The brush and rocks rolling down from the ridges around him, the low, puffy clouds and the cobalt sky, all seemed part of the same hokum, a meaningless gathering of random objects, a dream dreamed by a long-dead god. He was so lost in despair, and wondering what story he was going to make up to tell Ruth, that he didn't see the five horseback riders angling down a sloping, cedar-stippled ridge toward him until they were a hundred yards away. No, not five riders. Six riders on five horses. Two of the rough-garbed, unshaven, heavily-armed men were riding double on a beefy sorrel. They were trotting directly toward Coulter, one ominously sliding his rifle from his saddle boot. It wasn't hard to decipher their intentions. They'd obviously ridden a long way, hard, probably up from Taos, with a posse dusting their trail, and they needed another horse. Coulter's pulse beat a war rhythm in his ears, and the hammering of his heart made his wound bark. He reined the dun off the trail and spurred it hard. Coulter put the dun up a long, gradually shelving bluff on the west side of the trail, hearing beneath the frenetic thumps of his own mount's hooves those of his savage pursuers. They'd kill Coulter and take his horse as easily as shooting a coyote off a fresh calf carcass. The young drover cursed his stupidity. Licking his wounds when he should have been scouting his own trail was a good way to get himself killed and tossed in a gully. As he closed on the bluff's crest, he glanced behind. Two of the riders were peeling away from the other two, or three, counting the doubled-up sorrel, and it wasn't hard to figure out their intent here either. The two would swing around Coulter, hoping to cut him off on the other side of the bluff, while the other three continued fogging him up to the bluff's crest. Damn it! Fear gelled low in his belly, and as he crested the bluff, he saw the two cutthroats racing around the base of the bluff in the northeast. They'd already cut him off. Well, at least he had the high ground. Trace had always told him that high ground in a fight was as good as draw speed or having the best weapon. Coulter shucked his old Henry from the saddle boot and leapt off the dun's back, hitting the ground on one foot, then the other, and falling from the force of the dun's momentum. Northwest half turned toward him. Then the horse swung its head around, reins whipping, and lunged off across the broad, flat-topped bluff, buck-kicking its fear. As Coulter rolled, desperately clutching the Henry in his left hand, gunfire cracked, and bullets kicked up dust and sage branches around him. Rock shards bit into his face and eyes, instantly making them water. Brushing his gloved hand across his cheek, he rolled up against a low rock, racked a shell into the Henry's breech, and aimed at the three riders bounding toward him, 40 yards away and closing. The single rider was on the right and slightly ahead of the two riding double on the sorrel. The one riding in front jerked a big pistol out in front of him, lowering his head slightly and slitting one eye beneath his broad, slightly troughed hat brim. The big dragoon fired. The bullet screamed past his right cheek. Flinching slightly, Coulter planted the Henry sights on the shooter's chest between his bending, buckled suspenders and squeezed the trigger. The 44 slug slammed through his breastbone and punched him back against the man riding behind him. Damn it! Then they both rolled off the lunging Sorrel's right hip. The man behind the first hit the ground and rolled in a cloud of dust, snapping sage and rabbit brush. The hard shot shooter got his boot caught in a stirrup, and as his upper back and head slammed against the ground, was whipped forward, his lifeless body bouncing and flopping as the Sorrel continued toward Coulter, dust rising. Before the horse reached Coulter, it swerved sharply left, and the dead rider swung far out from the horse's side, throwing up sand and gravel over Coulter's head and shoulders. <laughs> then, boot and spur firmly wedged in the stirrup, the dead rider and the sorrel careened off across the bluff, as though following Coulter's own coyote done. The single rider had drawn his buckskin mare to a skidding halt when his two cohorts had been blown out of their saddle by Coulter's Henry. Holding his buckskin's reins taut in one hand, he raised his sharps carbine, propping the barrel on a forearm. The carbine exploded. The bullet hammered into the ground where Coulter would have been if the young drover hadn't flung himself to the right and rolled. 
Pushing up on an elbow, Coulter quickly pressed the Henry's brass butt plate against his shoulder and fired three rounds. Uh, uh, uh. Until through his own wafting powder smoke, he watched his attacker throw his carbine straight up over his head and tumble back over his mare's stiff tail. The mare lunged forward and swerved sharply right, galloping eastward while shaking her head. Hearing hooves pounding behind him, he turned to see the other two riders lunging up the backside of the bluff. Smoke puffed around the pistol of the second man, while the man in the lead, a tall, gaunt-faced outlaw with stringy black hair hanging below his shoulders, extended a sawed-off double-barrel shotgun in his right hand like a pistol and closed one eye to aim down the broad twin bores at Coulter. Coulter froze as he opened the Henry's breech to eject the smoking cartridge. The black-haired gent had him dead to rights. <laughs> 